My name is Rowan Ellis, and this happened to me in August of 1993. I worked as a ranger in the Appalachian Mountains, in a remote national forest known for its stunning vistas and tangled ancient woods. Lived a quiet life, spent most of my time on trail maintenance and educating novice hikers. The worst trouble we usually had was the occasional twisted ankle or a lost camper. I never suspected the darkness lurking just beyond the veil of civilization. My partner that season was a greenhorn named Brooks. He was all youthful enthusiasm and book smarts, a stark contrast to my grizzled, seen-it-all demeanor. I liked the kid. He was earnest, good-natured, and I secretly hoped some of my experience would rub off on him. One hot summer afternoon, we received a garbled distress call over the radio. The source was pinpointed to a deep ravine several miles off any marked trail. An experienced group of hikers had reported a creature sighting. Their description sent shivers down my spine, even accounting for exaggeration that comes with fear. We grabbed our gear and headed out. The sun was beginning its descent by the time we reached the coordinates. The forest was eerily still, not even the usual evening chorus of birds. The experienced hikers we found were shaken to their core. Their leader, a seasoned outdoors woman named Sarah, described stumbling across an abandoned campsite, a tent ripped to shreds, gear scattered around in disarray, and something else. A deer carcass, she'd said, picked clean and left hanging from a tree branch like some grotesque ornament. And then she described the creature itself, skeletal, towering over the treetops, its skin stretched over protruding bones, with eyes that glowed a sickly yellow in the dappled sunlight. I'd heard tales like this before, local legends to explain away the occasional missing person. Never put much stock in them. But there was no mistaking the sincerity of the group's terror. Something had rattled even Sarah's iron nerves. Brooks was pale, but his eyes held a strange mixture of excitement and dread. We documented the scene, collected what little evidence we could, and sent the hikers on their way with the standard warnings about wildlife. Once they were gone, I turned to Brooks. Time to see what we're dealing with, I said, my voice gruff to hide a creeping unease. Hours of careful tracking led us deeper into the ravine. With each snap of a twig under our boots, my senses were on high alert. The sun was dipping below the horizon, painting the forest in long, ominous shadows. And then, I saw it. Perched on a rocky outcropping, the creature was silhouetted against the fading light. It was far larger than any predator I'd ever encountered, with limbs that looked brittle and impossibly long. Its ribs protruded through its leathery skin, and its head was elongated, almost canine, with those same unnerving yellow eyes. It observed us with a chilling intelligence. Brooks let out a choked gasp, and the creature's head snapped in our direction. In one fluid motion, it scrambled off the rock and disappeared into the undergrowth with a swiftness that defied its ungainly form. Our pursuit was fueled by equal parts adrenaline and desperation. Panic threatened to consume young Brooks, his breath coming in ragged gasps as he stumbled over roots and rocks. I urged him forward, my worry about the creature eclipsed by concern for my partner. We were in way over our heads. The trees thinned, giving way to a steep clearing washed in moonlight. The creature stood in the center, its grotesque form stark against the silver night. It crouched low, a predator poised to strike. A piercing scream shattered the silence. A blurred form barreled from the shadows, colliding with the creature with astonishing force. Brooks. Adrenaline and fear had transformed the usually cautious rookie into a reckless, desperate fighter. The creature was knocked off balance, its long limbs flailing. I scrambled to gain a clear shot, my rifle shaking in my hands. Shots rang out, echoing through the ravine. The creature jerked, letting out a roar that echoed off the rock walls and thrashed against Brooks's attack. Brooks went down in a tangle of limbs, his screams cutting through the night air. I fumbled for another round, my heart a frantic drumbeat against my ribs. The creature staggered, and with a final keening wail, it disappeared into the darkness. I sprinted to Brooks's side. Blood pooled beneath him, staining the pale rocks. His eyes were wide, filled with a terrible pain and an even deeper fear. He gasped, a thick crimson liquid bubbling on his lips, and then the light left his eyes. Grief and fury swirled within me, a 
a toxic mix that threatened to consume me whole. I knelt beside Brooks's lifeless body, a desperate wave of denial crashing over me. This couldn't be happening. Not here. Not now. Not to him. With trembling hands, I radioed for backup, my voice cracking with the strain of keeping my composure. Then came the impossible task. I had to carry him out. I laid his body across my shoulders like a fallen soldier and began the grim trek back through the unforgiving wilderness. Hours later, I emerged from the woods near a deserted logging road, my body screaming in protest under Brooks's weight. Headlights cut through the pre-dawn gloom. Back up, finally. I staggered to the side of the road and collapsed, my strength finally failing. I only vaguely remember the flurry of activity that followed. The other rangers hushed voices, the flash of medical lights, then a merciful oblivion that swallowed me. I woke in a sterile hospital room, the smell of antiseptic bringing the events of the previous night flooding back with horrifying clarity. Brooks was dead. And I knew, deep down, things could never go back to the way they were. The official explanation? Animal attack. Maybe a bear, maybe something undocumented. I played along. It was easier than trying to explain the unexplainable, facing the pity and disbelief in the eyes of those who had no understanding. After a mandatory leave of absence, I returned to duty, but I was a changed man. Gone was the easygoing ranger who'd enjoyed a kinship with the woods. I became withdrawn, haunted. Every creaking tree branch was a potential threat, every shadow a monster waiting to strike. Sleep brought only nightmares, a grotesque replay of the creature and the light fading from Brooks's eyes. I started carrying a sidearm, even off duty. Couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, hunted. Word gets around, even in the tight-knit ranger community. Soon I was assigned mostly desk duty, or partnered with older rangers who saw me as a broken relic. They didn't understand. None of them could. One night, a year after Brooks's death, I packed my truck, left an unsigned resignation letter on my supervisor's desk, and drove without any particular destination in mind. There was no place I felt safe anymore. The years since have been a blur of back roads and lonely campsites. I've moved from national forest to national forest, never staying long in one place. Worked odd jobs, anything to keep myself going. Logger, hunting guide, ranch hand. Always kept my eyes on the tree line, my rifle within reach. And that sometimes out on the edge of town I'll catch a glimpse, a flash of elongated limbs disappearing into an alleyway, a pair of glowing eyes watching from a darkened storefront. They tell me I'm paranoid, suffering from PTSD. Maybe they're right, but I saw what I saw, and sometimes I think the creature is toying with me, leading me on a twisted scavenger hunt of sightings and near misses. Or maybe it's just my imagination, fueled by grief and an unresolved need for vengeance. Either way, the hunt has become my life. I've crisscrossed the country, following whispers and half-remembered stories from old-timers who share my haunted look. Each rumor sparks a flicker of desperate hope that this will be the time, the place, where I'll finally face that monstrous thing again. Folks have started to talk. They call me the Monster Hunter, a nickname whispered in truck stops and dimly lit bars. Some pity me, some mock me, but a few, a haunted few who've also lost loved ones in the shadowy places, pass me scraps of information. A mutilated cattle carcass in Montana, a string of missing persons in the Pacific Northwest, a chilling photo of a skeletal handprint on a foggy car window. It's never enough, never a clear trail, but it keeps me going. I often return to the Appalachians, drawn back to the place where it all began. I'll stand on that same rocky outcropping, the wind whispering through the trees, and I'll stare into the dimming light until the shadows seem to writhe and take on monstrous forms. Every rustle of leaves sets my heart pounding. I goad the creature, silently daring it to show itself. Because the truth is, I'm not sure if I want to find the creature, or if it wants to find me. Part of me still clings to the hope that killing it will bring some closure, erase the guilt that gnaws at me. But a cold, bitter part of me knows revenge might not bring the peace I crave. Brooks will still be dead. The wilderness, once my sanctuary, will remain a place of lurking terror. 
Maybe there's some twisted kind of comfort in this solitary pursuit, in knowing that even in a world that dismisses my experiences, I'm not crazy. The monsters are real. And somewhere lurking in the forgotten corners of the wild, one monster waits. It's a chilling kind of companionship in this lonely crusade. Yet, even as I walk these shadowed paths, a sliver of me hopes for a different ending, that someday maybe I'll find a place where the trees don't seem to hide malevolent eyes, and that maybe out there amongst the endless green, I'll find a way to leave the ghosts of the past behind and just be an old ranger, at peace. My name is Asher Nolan, and this happened to me in August of 2006. I worked as a backcountry ranger in North Cascades National Park, Washington. I'm the type of guy who finds solace in isolation. So, after my wife left, the deep woods became my sanctuary. I knew every ridge, every crevice of those mountains. Maybe that's why I got complacent, and why I didn't see it coming. That August morning started like any other. I loaded my pack, grabbed a strong cup of coffee, and headed out for a routine trail survey. The air was crisp, with that first hint of the changing season, and the forest floor was turning from green to gold. Around midday, something caught my eye. A deer carcass, half covered by branches and dried leaves. I approached cautiously. It's always a risk coming across fresh carrion out here. But what I saw wasn't the work of a bear or cougar. The carcass wasn't torn apart, but rather disassembled. The cuts were precise, almost surgical, and the bones, they looked almost polished, gnawed clean beyond anything I'd witnessed before. It sent a shiver down my spine. Then I heard it, a low rustling from somewhere uphill. I called out, thinking it was another ranger. No answer. The trees up there were thick, dense, casting deep shadows across the steep slope. I scanned through the trunks, my fingers tightening around my rifle. There! A flash of movement between two towering pines. But whatever it was, it moved unnaturally fast like nothing human. Hey, stop right there, I shouted, trying to sound more confident than I felt. Silence. Then the rustling started again, closer this time, circling me. I felt a prickling on the back of my neck. I'd made a terrible mistake, venturing out alone into this remote stretch of the park. Suddenly, it lunged from the undergrowth a massive blur of dark form and gleaming eyes. I'll never forget the first time I saw the creature in its entirety. It stood at least seven feet tall, impossibly thin, its skin a mottled brown-black, blending sickeningly well with the shadows. Its limbs were far too long, ending not in hands but in razor-sharp claws. The creature tilted its head, and those eyes, large almond-shaped, glowing with a predatory intelligence that pierced me to my core. The thing studied me, and for a terrifying moment, I knew what it was like to be prey. A piercing scream shattered the stillness. I recognized the voice. Amelia, one of the newer rangers. She'd been assigned a section of trail not far from mine. My blood turned to ice. That creature was heading right for her. I took off running, my heart pounding a frantic rhythm against my ribs. The terrain was rough, treacherous, branches whipping my face. I heard Amelia scream again, this time cut short, then gunfire. Bursting through the trees, I stumbled upon a scene of horrific chaos. Amelia lay crumpled on the ground, her uniform soaked in blood. And the creature, it was crouched over her, its glistening claws ripping into her body with methodical precision. Pure, primal rage ignited within me. I lifted my rifle and fired, aiming for its head. The creature let out a guttural roar of pain and bolted into the trees. I raced to Amelia, praying for a miracle, but it was too late. The damage was catastrophic, the same clean, surgical cuts I'd seen on the deer. She died right there in my arms, her eyes wide with terror. I'll never forget her last, choked breath. The rest of that day was a blur. Radioing for backup, the evacuation team arriving, the questions... Questions I couldn't answer. There was no trace of the creature aside from pools of Amelia's blood and the unsettling sense that we weren't alone. They wrote it off as a bear attack, a rogue male maybe, but I knew better. I spent the weeks that followed in a kind of numb haze, 
haunted by what I saw and what I lost. Then the nightmares started. Vivid, visceral dreams where the creature found me, those eyes piercing the darkness. My sleep became a battlefield, leaving me exhausted, hollow. My superiors started to notice. They suggested time off, a psych evaluation, anything to explain why one of their top rangers was unraveling. I quit before they had the chance to fire me. My marriage was gone, my job, and now my sanity seemed to be teetering on the edge. Three months later, I was in a dusty bar in some forgotten corner of Wyoming, trying to drink away the memories, when I saw the news report. A gruesome discovery in Olympic National Forest, two rangers killed, same wounds as I'd seen on Amelia. That familiar dread twisted in my gut. It was back. And it was hunting. I stumbled out of the bar and made a frantic call to the lead ranger of Olympic, a tough old guy named Brooks. At first he scoffed, called me delusional. Then I described the creature, the impossible size, the eyes, the way it moved, and how it killed. That's when Brooks went silent. He told me to stay put, that he'd come out to Wyoming himself and talk to me. Brooks arrived a day later, a grim look on his face. He listened to my story, no judgment, no accusations of me being crazy. By the end, the man looked ten years older. He confessed that his rangers were scared, that there was a sense of something out there, something unseen. Brooks made the decision. We packed supplies and returned to Olympic, ready to face the monster that had shattered our lives. Our hunt began at dawn. Days turned into nights as we trekked into the ancient forests, an unspoken fear pressing down on us. Brooks, myself, and two more rangers, seasoned veterans like ourselves, hardened and armed to the teeth. We set up a perimeter in the area where the previous attacks happened, hoping to lure the creature into a trap. Night fell, an oppressive blanket of shadows and lurking dread. We huddled around a small fire, weapons at the ready, straining our senses for any sign of the beast. The silence was deafening, broken only by the crackling fire and the occasional unsettling rustling of leaves that sent chills down our spines. Hours ticked by with agonizing slowness. Just when my eyelids began to grow heavy, it happened. A twig snapped behind us. We whipped around, guns poised. There it was, a silhouette outlined against the faint moonlight. It moved with eerie grace, circling us like a predator sizing up its prey. We formed a defensive circle, our backs pressed together, watching every direction at once. The creature let out a low, guttural growl, a sound that echoed through the clearing, sending a wave of terror through our group. Suddenly, the creature charged. It lunged at Carter, one of the rangers, with blinding speed. The attack was a blur of claws and teeth. Carter raised his rifle, but it was too slow. The creature slammed into him, knocking him to the ground with bone-jarring force. His scream cut through the night as the creature began tearing into him. We fired our weapons, the gunfire deafening in the desolate forest. Desperation fueled us, but the bullets seemed to do little damage. Each blast only seemed to enrage the creature further. With an impossibly swift turn, the creature leaped at Brooks. He managed to raise his shotgun in defense. The weapon roared, blasting a chunk out of the creature's shoulder. It let out a piercing screech of pain, but didn't retreat. The impact knocked Brooks off his feet. The creature lunged for his throat, those razor claws glinting in the firelight. I rushed forward, screaming incoherently, and slammed the butt of my rifle into the creature's head. It staggered, disoriented. Blood oozed from the wound caused by Brooks's shotgun blast, but it wasn't enough to stop it. Carter was gone, a lifeless heap on the forest floor. The creature snarled, fixing its glowing eyes on me. Then, with a speed that defied its injury, it bolted back into the dense undergrowth and vanished. I knelt beside Brooks, his breathing ragged and shallow. He reached a shaking hand and clutched my arm. There's more, he coughed, blood bubbling in his throat. It's not, not just one. His eyes rolled back and his grip went slack. Brooks was dead. We were alone, two of us left against an unknown number of these monstrous predators. Exhausted and grief-stricken, we abandoned the clearing, retreating to the nearest ranger station as dawn broke over the treetops. I radioed for backup, my voice trembling as I tried to describe the night's horrors. 
Reinforcements arrived armed to the teeth, ready for a fight. A manhunt ensued, the likes of which the national parks had never seen. Rangers, search and rescue, trackers, SWAT teams. They scoured the forest for days, but found nothing. No trace of the creatures, no bodies, nothing but that dreadful silence hanging over the wilderness. In the end, the hunt was abandoned, the case officially closed, the deaths blamed on a possible rogue bear attack. The aftermath was a living nightmare. My report was dismissed. Trauma-induced hallucinations, they said. The other ranger who survived, a young, idealistic woman named Anya, backed up my story with chilling consistency. We were treated like pariahs, branded as unstable and written off as delusional. I lost the last shreds of my credibility, my career. But I know what I saw. I know what Anya and I faced in those woods. The park officials refuse to believe us, refuse to admit that there's something out there far more dangerous than any beast we've known. The public moved on, oblivious to the danger lurking in the shadows. But I can't pretend that it's over. Those eyes haunt my dreams, and every rustle of leaves sends a jolt of terror through my veins. I see reports of missing hikers, of unexplained animal mutilations in those same woods, and I know the truth. They're still out there, multiplying, learning, perhaps even growing bolder. A decade later, I live a solitary life on the outskirts of a small town. Most folks leave me alone casting wary glances at the crazy old ranger who talks about monsters in the woods. Sometimes in the dead of night, I look to the distant ridges, those mountains I once loved, and an uneasy feeling settles over me. I know the truth that the world refuses to hear, a truth that will haunt me to my dying day. The night Amelia died, I saw something in that creature's eyes, not just animal instinct, but a cold, calculating intelligence. That intelligence frightens me more than any teeth or claws ever could. I often wonder, was it really hunting us? Or were we merely prey in its cruel game? Does it remember me, the one who got away? There are nights I think I hear a strange rustling outside my window, the snapping of twigs under an impossible weight. But when I gather my courage and look out into the darkness, I find nothing. It's in those moments of quiet terror that I realize the worst part. They are patient. They are learning. And one day, they will return for me. My name is Ethan Walker, and this happened to me in September of 2019. I've been a park ranger in the Grand Tetons National Park, Wyoming, for close to 15 years. Married with three kids, two girls in middle school already, time sure flies. Love my job, and this place, with its towering mountain peaks, is practically paradise. That Wednesday started like most days. Early wake-up call, pot of strong coffee, ranger station briefing at 6 a.m., First call of the day seemed routine. Couple of hikers went missing. Happens a lot. Folks get turned around, lose track of time. They usually stumble back to the trailhead by nightfall, sheepish and dehydrated. This call was different. Hikers were seasoned, had all the gear. Wife reported them missing the night before, when they didn't make their prearranged check-in. Something immediately set off an alarm bell in my gut. Park supervisors put together a search and rescue team. Me, a few other rangers I've worked with for years, and a scrappy volunteer EMT named Brianne. Drove up to the trailhead, a spot me and the kids go camping during my off time. Beautiful place, right along a rushing river with views of the mountains. It felt wrong, sending us up that familiar path to search for these folks, not knowing if we'd find them alive or not. Brianne hiked alongside me, trying to make small talk. I wasn't much in the mood for chatter. My focus was on the ground, on any trace of a struggle, anything out of place. Found some tracks leading away from the main trail, probably ours, but you never know. I knelt down to inspect a piece of torn fabric, snagged on a branch. Bright blue, didn't match the missing hiker's clothing description. Unease washed over me. Something bad happened here. Deeper in, the woods grew thicker, sunlight barely piercing the canopy. We came across what was left of a campsite, a shredded tent, sleeping bags ripped open, gear strewn about like some giant had thrown a tantrum.
blood spatter on a nearby rock made my stomach turn. Brienne let out a choked gasp. Animal attack? She asked, but her shaky voice gave her away. This wasn't animal-like. It was too... deliberate. One of the guys, a no-nonsense veteran named Russ, radioed back to base with the gruesome find. The reply made us all go silent. A rancher reported something monstrous a few miles north, out by the forest edge. Some half-eaten deer and rambling descriptions of a huge bipedal creature covered in dark fur, dismissed as tall tales and an overactive imagination at the time. Not anymore. The tension between us ratcheted up to an unbearable level. No longer a search and rescue, we were a potential target. My grip tightened on my rifle. Told Brienne to stay close, though her shotgun looked like a toy compared to what we might be facing. Just up ahead we found them. What was left of them. The sight, it wasn't something I can erase from my mind. Bodies twisted at unnatural angles, limbs torn off, gashes deep enough to see bone like something had toyed with them before ending it. Brienne vomited beside a tree. I swallowed back the bile. We had to document this, get the photos back to base. As I worked, the forest around us felt too quiet, like something was watching us, biding its time. Hairs stood up on the back of my neck. I knew we weren't alone. We finished as fast as we could, then formed a tight ring, guns out, as we retreated back down the mountain. Never have I walked so slow or been so desperate to see the open sunlight again. Each snap of a twig, each rustle of leaves made us spin around, guns ready, hearts pounding. Just below the tree line, something massive moved behind a thicket. We all saw it, a dark shape, taller than any man, disappearing with unnatural speed into the shadows. We bolted down the rest of the trail, half running, half falling in our rush. Burst back into the clearing where our trucks were parked the sight of civilization never so welcome. The sun was setting. We'd been out there for hours, lost in some monstrous game of cat and mouse. Brienne was sobbing openly. None of us blamed her. What we saw, the fear, it breaks something in you. It did in me, I think. The debriefing was a blur. Supervisors, wildlife specialists, even those FBI types who show up when things get truly weird. Our statements, my photos all laid out on a table. Brienne was in shock, barely able to speak. I told them everything, the woods, the campsite, that chilling last glimpse of the creature. Most of them looked at me like I was either crazy or lying. A hotshot higher up, some DC suit sent in to manage the mess, scoffed. Mountain lion gone rogue probably explains the rancher's story too. We'll send out hunters, tranquilize it, case closed. I couldn't let that lie. With respect, sir, I started, but he cut me off, his voice dripping with condescension. Save the heroics, Ranger. We'll handle this. The dismissal, worse than the horror up on the mountain, burned in my gut. Something monstrous was out there, had a taste for human blood, and they were going to downplay it as a problem animal. I drove home that night barely able to see the road through hot tears, part rage, part terror for my family and everyone living in the shadow of those mountains. Couldn't sleep. Kept seeing those broken bodies, imagining those yellow, malevolent eyes from the tree line. I tossed and turned, and then it hit me. The torn piece of blue fabric we'd found. There were other victims out there. I had to go back. Don't ask me to explain the insanity of that decision. Survivor's guilt? Sense of duty? Maybe I hoped finding proof would make those bastards in suits listen. Around 3 a.m., I slipped out of bed, a lie about a false alarm call ready for my wife, who only half believed me. Packed supplies like I was going on another mission, only this one wasn't sanctioned. Drove back to the trailhead just as dawn was breaking. Parked out of sight in the trees, grabbed my gear and forced myself back onto that blood-soaked path. My body protested every step, but something stronger pushed me on. I found the campsite again, the ripped tent still fluttering in the morning breeze. Then I went further, to where I last saw the blue fabric. It was there, a torn scrap of a backpack caught on a branch, and beside it, a trail of blood leading deeper into the woods. Fresh blood. The creature was injured, maybe from the struggle with those hikers. A desperate hope flared in my chest. If it was bleeding, it wasn't invincible. 
I followed that bloody trail, ignoring the prickling fear and the rational voice screaming in my head to turn back. It wound through the forest, and then it ended in a small clearing near a creek. What I found there made me go cold. Not the creature, but a body, a woman, ripped open just like the others. But the blue backpack confirmed it. This was the rancher's daughter, gone missing after her dad's sighting. Despair washed over me. I'd been too late. Then, a noise behind me, a low, guttural growl that made my blood freeze. I whirled, rifle raised. There it stood, maybe twenty feet away. Even in the dimness of the clearing, I saw it clearly. Tall as a damn tree, a patchwork of matted black and brown fur, some patches raw and bloody. Its head was like some wolfish nightmare, teeth stained dark red. But it was those eyes, glowing yellow orbs fixated on me, that stole my breath. We stood frozen, predator and prey, neither of us moving. I knew I should take the shot, had one chance to at least wound it. But my arms felt like lead, my brain screaming at me that there was no way my standard-issue rifle was going to put that thing down. It was like shooting a bear with a pellet gun. The creature lowered its head, then charged. I don't even remember dropping my gun. I turned and ran. Briars tore at my clothes, branches whipped at my face. I could hear the creature barreling behind me, its snarls echoing through the trees. Just as I thought it had me, I burst out onto a dirt road, the old logging access trail, hardly ever used. A flicker of hope. I sprinted down that road, knowing vaguely it led to the highway. Didn't dare look back. My lungs screamed, my legs burned, but the terror fueled me. The trees thinned, I saw sunlight ahead, and the blessed sight of a parked logging truck, abandoned and rusty. I fumbled for my keys, which, of course, had fallen out probably miles back in the mad dash. No time. I scrambled up onto the hood, onto the roof. Crouched there, gasping, waiting for the monster to crash out of the trees. But it never came. The silence stretched on. No sign of the creature. I slid back down, shaking, unsure if I'd escaped or if it was just toying with me playing some sick game. Hours passed. Eventually, I walked back to my truck, barely able to function on pure adrenaline and terror. The drive home was in a fog. I collapsed into bed, mumbling excuses to my worried wife. Later that night, helicopters thundered overhead, spotlights cutting across the dark foothills of the Tetons. The official hunt had begun. They never found it. They sealed off the trail, the whole section of the park, Claimed it was the problem mountain lion successfully killed. Case closed in their eyes. But I see that clearing every time I close mine. The girl's broken body next to her blue backpack. Proof of something they refused to acknowledge. A threat they failed to stop. I haven't been the same since. I still patrol, but the mountains don't feel safe. Not anymore. I watch the tree lines and people give me sideways glances. Wondering at the haunted look I can't seem to hide. Sometimes I think I see movement in the shadows, catch a glimpse of those glowing eyes just before they melt back into the forest. I tell myself I'm imagining things. I hope to God that I am. My name is Mark Sloan, and this happened to me in September of 1994. I've spent the better part of my life working as a park ranger. I started out in a smaller patch of forest, but eventually made it out to Olympic National Park in the Pacific Northwest. It's rugged territory filled with dense, untouched forest, perfect for someone who craves a bit of solitude. Most of what we do involves light patrols, campsite maintenance, and the occasional bit of search and rescue when hikers get a bit too ambitious and lose their way. One crisp autumn morning, a call came in from dispatch. A group of teenagers had gone out on an unapproved overnight hike and failed to return on schedule. They'd been due back two days prior and hadn't checked in since venturing into the wilderness three days earlier. This wasn't uncommon. Cell signal is a fickle thing deep in the woods, so after initial contact is lost, we give them a couple of days in case they've just run into delays. But after waiting it out, it was time to go in. My partner at the time, a seasoned ranger named Ben Cooper, and I took on the case. They'd set out on a designated trail, but from what their parents told us, the group was prone to a bit of adventurous off-roading. 
It meant we weren't simply following a well-trodden path and hoping they were just lagging behind. We packed the standard gear, emergency supplies, first aid, radios, and a couple of rifles, because you never truly know what you might encounter. Ben carried one, more for animal encounters than anything else, but even back then, I felt uneasy about having them. Still, it was protocol and easier to hike with it than get in trouble for not. The first day was uneventful. We moved fast, staying light. Our plan was to cover as much of the known route as possible, then begin a grid search in the areas where they were more likely to have strayed. We called out, whistled, and scanned for any sign of disturbance. Snapped branches, footprints that deviated from the trail. Nothing. As the sun began its descent, we made camp. Our conversations were a mix of practical discussions about the next day and idle talk about our families to pass the time. As the veteran, Ben regaled me with stories from his early ranger days. I'd been on the job long enough now to have a few myself. Crazy thing. Once found a campsite that was totally torn apart. I mean tent ripped, sleeping bag shredded, gear tossed everywhere. No blood, though. That was the freaky part. We joked about the possibilities. A runaway bear, or even that ever-reliable Bigfoot theory. It helped distract from the unease that lingers in the back of the mind in cases like these. At nightfall, it's easy to let the shadows and the rustling of the trees play tricks on you. Just get some sleep, Mark. Tomorrow's gonna be a long haul. Ben cut through the tension hanging in the air. He was right. Rest, even a few hours of fitful sleep was a necessity out here. But as I lay there, my mind fixated on those kids, out there somewhere, scared, hurt perhaps. That night, I dreamt of their voices, calling out for help amidst the towering trees. Day two followed a similar pattern to the first, slow, meticulous progress and no signs of them. The parents had mentioned a small, secluded lake that the group had been aiming for. It was a long shot, but we started angling our route in that direction. Yet, with each passing hour, the worry gnawed at me. The terrain had grown steeper, the forest thicker. Even with daylight filtering through the canopy, the area felt claustrophobic, a maze of twisted branches and shadowed undergrowth. My eyes darted in every direction, a constant scan of the surroundings for anything amiss. The silence was heavy, punctuated only by the rhythmic crunch of our boots across fallen foliage. That was when Ben froze, raising his fist, the signal to halt. His eyes were fixed intently on a spot a few yards ahead. I followed his gaze, my rifle rising reflexively. There, amongst the tangled roots of a massive fir tree, lay a patch of disturbed earth, leaves kicked away, and a single piece of bright fabric snagged on a branch. It was a scrap of vibrant blue, a mismatch with the muted tones favored by experienced hikers, further confirming this was no ordinary trek. Ben and I exchanged a silent look, a shared understanding of what we were finding. This wasn't just a simple delay. Something had happened here. We split up, slowly circling the site, weapons at the ready. I found another piece of fabric, this time a fluorescent pink, then a tattered bandana patterned with cartoon characters, decidedly young. A few feet further, something glinted under a pile of leaves, half buried in the dirt. I crouched down, heart pounding, and dug it out. A smashed cell phone, its screen a spiderweb of cracks. Ben appeared at my side, his face grim. Keep an eye out for any other belongings, or... He didn't need to finish. We both knew what the unspoken or meant. Discarded gear was one thing, but bloodstains or torn clothing would tell a very different, far more sinister story. The next hour passed in a tense blur. Each step forward felt like stepping into the unknown. We'd moved into radio silence, no point in risking our position being given away. My every sense was on high alert, straining for a misplaced sound, a glimpse of movement in the dense undergrowth. And then, I saw it. Not the missing teens, but a trail of some kind, a narrow path cutting through the vegetation heading off the main path. It was subtle, easily missed by an untrained eye, but it was undeniably purposeful. Someone, or something, had passed this way repeatedly. I signaled to Ben, pointing at the faint track. We followed, our footsteps muted, our breathing shallow. 
The trail wound deeper into the forest. The sunlight dwindled, swallowed whole by the towering evergreens. We moved cautiously, eyes scanning ahead and behind, a creeping uneasiness settling upon us like a shroud. It was far too quiet, no birdsong, not even the usual rustle of small forest creatures. The air felt heavy, expectant, as though the whole forest was holding its breath. The path wound sharply and suddenly we broke out into a small clearing. It looked ordinary enough, a patch of flattened earth, some overgrown bushes circling it. But something about it set my teeth on edge, a prickling sensation on the back of my neck. Ben held up his hand, his expression tight. He pointed towards the far end of the clearing. I followed his gaze and froze. There stood a crude structure, a lean-to built of branches lashed together with vines. Its opening gaped at us like a ragged mouth. Strewn on the ground in front of it was a pile of belongings, backpacks torn and stained with something dark, a sleeping bag ripped open, and scattered amongst the debris, flashes of bone, starkly white against the dim forest floor. Every instinct screamed at me to run, but before I could move, before I could even process the horror unfolding before me, a shadow detached itself from the edge of the clearing. It was immense, hulking, a silhouette of tangled limbs and matted fur that towered well over seven feet tall. Its eyes, glinting in the dim light, were utterly inhuman, pools of pure darkness. A low, guttural growl rumbled from deep within its chest. Time seemed to stretch out, each second a heavy weight dragging me downwards. Ben's shout, a desperate warning, snapped me out of my paralysis. I raised my rifle, more on instinct than any clear plan. It let out a roar, a primal sound that shook the very leaves on the trees. Ben was already moving, yelling for me to follow. We sprinted back into the trees, the creature's roar echoing behind us. The adrenaline coursing through my veins blocked out any rational thought. There was only direction. Away. We stumbled through the dense foliage, the undergrowth tearing at our clothes and scratching our exposed skin. Branches whipped against our faces and roots snagged at our feet. My lungs burned and my legs throbbed in protest, but fear propelled me forward. I could hear the creature behind us, its heavy footfalls and guttural snarls keeping our pace frantic. Ben's voice broke through the panicked haze. Split up. Divide and confuse. He veered sharply to the left and I obeyed, cutting right. I could still hear him, gasping and crashing through the undergrowth, his presence a perverse comfort amidst the chaos. I didn't know how long I ran. Time warped, blending into a nightmarish blur of pounding heartbeats and ragged breaths. At some point I stumbled and fell hard. Pain exploded in my knee, but I lurched back to my feet, ignoring the white-hot agony. Finally, gasping and drenched in sweat, I burst out of the thickest of the forest and found myself on a familiar path one of the secondary trails. It was a lifeline, a thin thread of sanity in this all-encompassing madness. I ran, no longer thinking of direction, simply driven by the need to put distance between myself and that... that thing in the woods. I don't know how long it took me to reach the ranger station. I remember a blur of faces, frantic voices, and a whirlwind of urgent questions. Ben never came out of those woods. The next few days are a haze. A search team scoured the forest, the scale of the operation growing with each passing hour. Teams armed with hunting rifles, helicopters, and even a contingent of National Guard soldiers joined the search. They found more. Trails leading deeper into the heart of the forest. Small hidden clearings littered with debris and the gnawed bones of animals. Deer, raccoons, maybe even the remains of the occasional lost hiker. But there was no trace of Ben, and, horrifyingly, no sign of the creature either. It was as if it had vanished. The official explanation was an animal attack. A bear, possibly a rogue cougar. It was a flimsy explanation and everyone knew it, but it was easier than the alternative. Even I held on to the desperate hope that maybe, just maybe, Ben was still alive, lost, injured, but somewhere out there. For weeks afterward, I couldn't go back into the woods. The creak of floorboards in my own home would send me leaping to my feet, my heart pounding. Even in the safety of my living room, surrounded by familiar things, I was haunted by the echo of its roar, the image of its inhuman eyes seared into my memory. They eventually forced me to take time off. 
counseling. At first, I resisted. If I wasn't actively doing something to find Ben, then what was the point? But with time, the futility, the sheer hopelessness of it all, sank in. I never went back to being a ranger, couldn't face setting foot in the wilderness again. The city felt wrong, cramped, stifling. But it was also safe, predictable. No unexplained disappearances, no lurking shadows at the edge of the tree line. I'd see reports in the news sometimes, sporadic disappearances in national parks across the country, sightings of strange creatures, never clear photos, never any real proof. But I knew. They never found Ben's body, and they never found that thing, whatever it was. And sometimes at night, when the shadows lay thick and the wind whispers through the window panes, I swear I can still hear that guttural roar echoing through the deepest, darkest part of my memory. The aftermath was swift and brutal. Olympic National Park was shut down indefinitely. Trails were sealed, warnings plastered at every potential entrance. It became a ghost land, a vast expanse of wilderness deemed too dangerous to tread. Hikers and nature lovers cried foul, petitions circulated, but ultimately the government stood firm. Too many disappearances, too much inexplicable evidence, and no viable explanation to offer the public. The story spiraled into legend. Conspiracy theories filled the void. Cryptid hunters railed against government cover-ups. The paranormal community declared it a portal to another dimension. The creature became a boogeyman, a campfire story swapped by adrenaline-seeking thrill chasers and wide-eyed children alike. For me, there was no legend, no mystery. Only a cold certainty of what lurked out there. A brutal truth that clawed at my sanity. I became a recluse, avoiding the news, wary of crowds. Each face became a blur, a potential mask hiding the eyes of a monster. Years turned into a decade, then two. Time, supposed to be a healer, did little to dull the sharp edges of loss and trauma. The world moved on. Ben's family moved on, as best they could. I never did. One late summer afternoon, driven by a desperate restlessness, I found myself on the outskirts of the park. There was a barricade, of course, weathered and tagged with graffiti, yet as impregnable as the day it had been erected. I lingered, staring into the dense mass of green beyond, my fingers tracing the rough outline of the missing person poster that still fluttered faintly from the weathered wood. A picture of Ben, smiling, his eyes alive in a way mine hadn't been in years. They say the forest calls to you. It does. It's both a whisper and a roar, inviting and threatening all at once. I turned away, knowing I would heed that call again, and again, always haunted by the choice I made that day, to run and survive, leaving Ben to a fate swallowed whole by the wilderness. My name is Ethan Walker, and this happened to me in September of 2010. I've been with the National Park Service nearly 10 years now, currently working in the vast expanse of Big Bend National Park down in Texas. Love the desert, feels different from other places I've worked, a stark, brutal kind of beauty. Took some adjusting after the mountains of Wyoming and the pine forests of Maine. But it's grown on me. I was on backcountry patrol that week, one of those stints where it's mainly about reminding lost hikers about hydration protocols and checking that overnight campers are following regulations. Usually uneventful stuff, but necessary. This time of year the heat gets fierce, and you want to head off trouble before it starts. Around midday on the third day, I got a radio transmission, a possible missing person report from a worried family member. The description sent chills down my spine. A middle-aged couple, experienced hikers out on the South Rim Trail for two days and hadn't checked in as scheduled. It was a tough trail, gaining over 2,000 feet in elevation. Plenty of spots where an unlucky slip or a heat-induced stumble could cause problems. I knew the South Rim well, tackled it a bunch of times myself for the views and the sense of accomplishment. Drove out to the trailhead, gathered what details I could from the distraught daughter, and started my solo search. I was familiar with the protocol, Look for signs of deviation from the trail, gear, anything out of the ordinary, and radio for backup once the situation was assessed. The first few miles yielded nothing, 
well-maintained trail, a few other hikers who reported nothing amiss, the usual sprawl of cacti and scrub brush under that merciless desert sun. Then I rounded a bend and saw it, a backpack ripped open and abandoned near a rocky outcropping. A surge of dread washed over me as I recognized the brand, the same one described by the couple's daughter. I radioed for backup, the words tight in my throat. It was more than a lost hiker situation now. Something bad had happened out here. I approached the outcropping cautiously, rifle drawn, the silence broken only by the rasp of my own breath. And there they were. Or rather, what was left of them. It was... It was a slaughterhouse. Blood-splattered rocks, shattered bones, shreds of clothing snagged on thorns. I stumbled back, wave of nausea threatening to overwhelm me. It wasn't an animal attack, nothing remotely normal. The injuries were grotesque, violent beyond anything I'd ever witnessed, even after all my years as a ranger. It was as though some impossibly powerful creature had torn them apart with brutal, frenzied rage. Backup arrived an agonizing hour later, a forensics team, a grim-faced crew of fellow rangers, and the inevitable park higher-ups trying to contain the damage the gruesome discovery would cause. They questioned me, scrutinized my account, the unspoken suspicion hovering in the overheated air. Ranger loses it in the desert, creates a gruesome scene for some twisted reason. I didn't blame them, the crime scene defied belief. I knew how insane it sounded, but I also knew what I saw. Nights that followed were a nightmare blur, snatches of images, gleaming yellow eyes in the desert darkness, the guttural roar that echoed in the barren canyons, the way the searchlight swept over the rocks, highlighting the blood but never finding whatever made those monstrous wounds. I started sleeping with a loaded gun under my pillow, jumping at every creaking floorboard, every flicker of headlights outside my window. Finally, word came down. The official cause of death, animal attack, perpetrator unknown, case closed. Just like that. The evidence, they said, was inconclusive. The injury's not inconsistent with some unknown predator defending its territory. They buried the couple in the dusty cemetery on the outskirts of the park, another grim statistic of wilderness that can never be fully tamed. But I saw the hesitation in the eyes of the forensic specialists, heard the whispers shared around campfires when they thought I was out of earshot. The other rangers, the ones I'd worked side by side with for years, started giving me wide berth. I was the one touched by the unexplainable, tainted by an experience they couldn't even begin to fathom. My protests felt hollow, my insistence on something out there. Something monstrous, landing not with the urgency of truth, but with the echoes of a mind starting to unravel in the wake of trauma. I'm writing this from a motel room in some nameless town on the edge of the desert, a few hastily packed belongings stuffed into my weathered old duffel bag. I handed in my resignation this morning. Can't stay here, not with that constant gnawing dread coiling in my gut like a venomous snake. Can't stay and risk it coming for me next. They can dismiss the horror, write their reports, explain it all away with neat bureaucratic phrases. But out there, in the vast expanse where the sun casts stark shadows and the wind whispers through the canyons, something lurks, something unnatural. And after what I saw, I think it knows where to find me. I don't know where I'll go, or how long I can keep running. Maybe I'll head north, lose myself in the anonymous sprawl of a big city where the worst predators walk on two legs. Maybe I'm being paranoid. Maybe I did somehow manufacture those horrors in a mind pushed past its breaking point by the relentless desert and the brutal solitude. Doesn't matter. Every rustle of leaves, every flicker of shadow sets off a jolt of adrenaline in my veins. Makes me picture those impossibly large clawed feet, that gaping, monstrous maw dripping with... I think I heard a noise outside my room. I'll go check. The floorboards creaked beneath my boots every sound amplified in the echoing silence of the cheap motel room. I moved towards the window, my grip tightening on the gun. Something was there, a flicker of movement just beyond the faded yellow curtain. My gut clenched, a scream caught in my throat. It couldn't be. Couldn't have tracked me down. I closed my eyes for a split second, a futile attempt at gathering my shattered composure. No point in hiding, no use in cowering. 
I tore open the curtain, braced for anything. Empty. The dusty parking lot, silent and still under the harsh fluorescent lights, stretched out before me. A battered pickup truck hummed in the distance, a lone figure hunched over the wheel. Ordinary. My pulse hammered in my ears as relief crashed over me, followed swiftly by a wave of shame. I was losing it, seeing threats in every shadow, my nerves frayed beyond repair. But then, a movement caught my eye. On the edge of the parking lot, where a stand of mesquite trees cast long, skeletal shadows, a figure was watching. Too tall, too thin, standing unnaturally still in the harsh light. And as it turned its head towards me, moonlight gleamed on two impossibly bright yellow eyes. My breath caught. It was him. No, it... The creature. It was here. In this nondescript nowhere town, it had found me. This was the end. A bitter resignation washed over me, replacing the frantic terror. I couldn't run anymore. I raised my gun, more in defiance than in any real belief that it would have an effect. The creature observed me, no sign of fear in its inhuman glare, only a cold, calculating intelligence. It took a step forward, a sinuous, unhurried movement that belied its grotesque shape. With each step, the details became chillingly clear, the ragged mottled fur draped over its hulking frame, the impossibly long limbs tipped with sickle claws designed for tearing. Its head was like a nightmarish fusion of wolf and something else, all teeth and predatory instinct. A low growl rumbled from its throat. I fired a warning shot, more of a plea than a threat. The report shattered the night, the creature flinched but didn't retreat. It was toying with me, its hunter's instinct playing out this cruel game to the bitter end. I fired again and again. At first, it seemed as though the bullets had no effect, simply angering it further. But then it let out a shriek, a sound of rage and pain that echoed off the crumbling walls of the motel. A thin trickle of blood, eerily black in the moonlight, seeped from a wound on its massive shoulder. A flicker of something like hope ignited in me. It wasn't invincible. It could be hurt, maybe even... My desperate thoughts were cut off as the creature charged, a blur of claws and fangs. I managed to get another shot off before it slammed into me, sending both of us crashing against the flimsy wall. Its stench enveloped me, rotting meat, something feral. I kicked out wildly, trying to dislodge it. The force of its impact had knocked the breath out of me, stars bursting in my vision. With a strength born of desperation, I fumbled for the discarded gun, my fingers slipping in the creature's hot, foul blood. The motel room door burst open, and the startled face of an elderly night clerk peered in. He screamed, a shrill sound that pierced the chaos, then turned and ran, his flimsy slippers slapping against the cracked concrete. The distraction was all I needed. The creature, momentarily startled by the noise, twisted its monstrous head. I seized the gun, jamming the barrel against its matted fur, and fired. And fired again. The reports echoed in the confined space, deafening me as the creature roared in agony. It thrashed, clawing at its face, its movements becoming less focused, frantic. I scrambled away, dragging myself across the debris-strewn parking lot, the creature's pained snarls fading behind me. I didn't know how badly I'd injured it, whether it would pursue me, but blind instinct propelled me forward. Stumbling into the battered pickup, I fumbled for the keys, my hands shaking. I barely got it started before the motel room door exploded outward, the creature's immense form silhouetted against the now-empty doorway. It staggered then with one final chilling glare in my direction. It turned and vanished into the shadows beneath the mesquite trees. I drove. I drove through the night, fueled by adrenaline and lingering terror. The headlights cut a swath across endless highway, the monotony both terrifying and comforting. Every creak of the old truck, every flicker of movement in the rearview mirror sent my heart pounding anew. My side ached and my head throbbed, but I couldn't stop not until I was far, far away from the desolate stretch of desert and the motel parking lot marked with blood. By dawn, I'd cross state lines and abandon the truck in a nondescript suburb. A bus heading north seemed as good a destination as any. I sank into the worn seat, trying in vain to ignore the stares directed at my disheveled appearance, the dark circles under my eyes, and the gun I still clutched with numb fingers. The landscape word passed in a blur as I tried to process what had happened. 
A part of me, a fading fragment of rationality, clung to the hope that it had all been a psychotic break. A final descent into PTSD-fueled madness. The news report a week later shattered that illusion. A headline screamed from a tattered newspaper left on a neighboring bus seat. Gruesome animal attack leaves hikers dead in Big Bend. The photo, grainy and horrific, showed a campsite ravaged in a sickening echo of the scene that started my nightmare. My trembling hands dropped the paper. They'd covered it up again, contained the impossible within the safety of the explainable. I bought a ticket back to the desert town, back to the motel room littered with evidence of the impossible struggle. The room was untouched, a shrine to a horror nobody else believed. I packed my meager belongings, an unsettling determination forming within me. It's out there, and others will die because of the lies and the cover-ups. Maybe I'm crazy, maybe I'm the only one who sees it for what it truly is. But I won't let them dismiss what happened. Won't let them bury the truth along with the broken bodies it leaves in its wake. I can't stay. Each rustle of wind through the mesquite, each creak of the aging floorboards, is a whisper of its presence. But I won't disappear quietly into the faceless oblivion of the city either. I know where to go, know the vast, shadowy places where it hunts. I won't live in fear. I'll become the hunter. My name is Kellen Scott, and this happened to me in August of 2014. I'm a national park ranger, have been for the last 15 years, bouncing from post to post. I've hiked some glorious trails, seen sunrises that'd knock your socks off. But I was stationed in the Mount Rainier area of Washington for the weirdest couple of months of my career. See, my job's not just about happy campers and keeping trails clean. We get all sorts. The lost, the injured, the occasional less than savory type looking for a remote place to cause trouble. What I dealt with was none of the above. The first sign was a missing person report. A solo hiker, seasoned guy named Gary Beltran, just vanished off the Wonderland Trail. I know that route like the back of my hand, a multi-day loop with plenty of spots cell service goes kaput. But Beltran wasn't unaccounted for a few hours, or even overnight. It was a full five days before the call even came in. And get this, his family only started to worry when they got a bizarre text supposedly from him. Only it was all garbled, the words nothing but gibberish like a cat walked across a keyboard. Weird? Yeah, but people get disoriented, phones glitch out. Not yet enough to make me think this wasn't some routine case. Two weeks into the search, we found a campsite just off the trail. Beltrans, judging by the gear. Here's where things turned from strange to... Well, there's no other word for it but wrong. His tent was ripped, like something big clawed it. There was blood, a lot of it. Not in splatter patterns like from an animal attack, but in ragged streaks, as though something was dragged away. Whatever did that, it wasn't a bear, wolf, or cougar. We know their marks. This was deliberate and precise. I had this prickle down my spine like I was being watched. I filed a detailed report, but my superiors chalked it up to bad luck. We searched for weeks, never found a body. I thought that was the end of it. Boy, was I wrong. A few days after Beltran's disappearance, there was another report. This time, it was a young couple on a day hike. They claimed they saw something in the trees near Spray Park, said it moved too fast, was too big to be any animal they knew. Dismissed as nerves, tourists see bears and mistake their size all the time. Still, I was on edge. It was like a dark cloud had settled over the whole area. Things escalated after that. Sightings became more frequent. Whispers started, hikers passing each other on the trail comparing notes. They all described the same thing. Massive, moving with impossible speed, always lurking in the tree line just out of sight. Then, the worst happened. It was two days ago. A ranger buddy of mine, Leanne, was doing trail maintenance a couple miles off. That's when the radio calls started coming in, people reporting screams from near her location. I grabbed my gear and took off at a dead run, calling out her name. When I reached the spot, Leanne was gone. There was another patch of blood, more torn fabric, that same sickening sense of something monstrous dragging her away. 
The other hikers were pale-faced, babbling about a huge dark shape, eyes that glowed like embers. I'm writing this from a motel room outside the park. Got the hell out of there as quick as I could. I filed my report, but I don't think they believe me. They think it's stress, grief over Leanne. Hell, maybe they're right. Maybe I've snapped. But I know what I saw, what those hikers saw. And most chilling of all, I know I wasn't the one being hunted. We were the bait. Something out there is impossibly big, impossibly fast. It stalks these woods, moves like a shadow. And the worst part? I think it's smart. I think it's learning. I haven't slept in two days, afraid if I close my eyes I'll see those glowing eyes in the dark. My name is Wyatt Miller and this happened to me on October 6, 2012. Been a forest ranger in Mount Rainier National Park, Washington my whole life, just like my grandpa was. These trails, these giant trees, they're in my blood. But that day, I learned there are things in the world even the locals don't know about. Things that make you question everything. It started off routine enough. A report of a solo hiker, long overdue. Name of Amelia Kerr. Now, people get lost all the time. Tourists who don't respect the wilderness. Even experienced folks who have a stroke of bad luck. But this felt different. Amelia wasn't some casual hiker. Her gear was top-notch, and she had years of experience in these mountains. Something in my gut said trouble. I set out on the trail she'd last been seen on. It was a nasty day, rain whipping down, turning the paths into muddy messes. Visibility was poor, and aside from the odd squirrel or crow, there wasn't a living soul in sight. I kept calling out Amelia's name, my voice ragged against the wind. Nothing came back but the echo of my own shouts and a rising sense of unease. Hours passed. I was soaked to the bone, starting to lose hope. That's when I found it. A patch of broken ferns off the trail, freshly disturbed. Then, a few yards further, a smear of blood on a tree trunk, dark against the wet bark. My heart hammered in my chest. I knelt down, touched the blood, still tacky, not too old. Something was wrong. Real wrong. I drew my gun, moving slower now, eyes darting between the shadows. The rain made it hard to see, hard to hear anything above the pounding of my pulse. And then, there it was. A footprint. Not human, though. Much bigger, with long, clawed toes. A shiver ran down my spine. I followed the trail of prints as best I could, the rain washing some away. They led deeper into the woods away from any trail I knew about. Adrenaline masked the exhaustion, and a sense of duty, stronger than fear, propelled me forward. I had to find Amelia, had to know what happened to her. The tracks went on for what felt like miles. The rain finally started to let up, but the fading light made things more treacherous. Then, up ahead, I saw a break in the trees. Not a clearing, more like a hollow. The trees circled round it, their branches skeletal against the darkening sky. And in the center, well, that's where the nightmare began. It looked like a cave at first. But as I got closer, I realized the dark opening wasn't rock. It was more like... skin. Smooth, leathery, and mottled gray with a faint, sickening pulse. My mind refused to process what I was seeing, and then came the smell rotting meat, mixed with something fouler, something that pricked at some primal part of my brain. Before I could back away, the ground beneath my feet rumbled. The skin-like cave thing trembled, and then a slit ripped open. An eye, milky white and the size of a dinner plate. It blinked, fixing me in its gaze. And that's when the creature emerged. God, I wish I hadn't seen it. Wish I could erase it from my memory. It was twice my height, all gnarled limbs and rippling muscle. Its skin, I told you, cave-like with pulsing veins beneath the surface. The head was small for its body, bald and elongated, with a mouth that split far too wide filled with rows of needle-like teeth. It took a step towards me. I fired a shot, more out of instinct than any hope of stopping it. The creature let out a roar that split the air, a mix of animal shriek and something far worse, something that made my bones vibrate. But it didn't slow down. I turned and ran. Blind panic took over. I scrambled through soaking undergrowth, 
branches whipping at my face, the creature's roars echoing behind me. I fumbled for my radio, trying to call for backup even as I knew it was useless. Help! I choked out, voice thick with terror. Unknown creature requesting immediate... The transmission cut out, filled with nothing but static. I looked up and saw the thing barreling towards me, its claws tearing through saplings like tissue paper. In that moment, I knew it was over. And then, a different sound split the air. Another gunshot. The creature faltered, a pained growl ripping from its throat. I risked a look back and saw it, another ranger uniform emerging from the trees, a rifle aimed steady. It was Harper, a grizzled old veteran who knew these woods as well as I did. Harper fired again. I saw the bullets hit their mark, but they did little more than annoy the creature. It lunged at him. I screamed Harper's name, but he didn't falter. He fired again and again, providing a distraction, buying me precious seconds. I scrambled to my feet, my mind kicking back in. I remembered the clearing I'd seen earlier. If I could just lead the creature there, out of the dense forest. I took off running again, shouting over my shoulder for Harper to follow me. I heard Harper pounding behind me, his labored breathing mixing with the creature's enraged bellows. The clearing seemed an eternity away, every root and rock a potential death trap. My legs screamed, lungs burned, but I kept running, fueled by desperation. Finally the trees thinned, and there it was the open space. I burst into the clearing, scrambling towards its center. Behind me, the creature erupted from the tree line. For one awful moment, it seemed poised to bound after me. But then it stopped short, just at the edge of the clearing. It paced back and forth, letting out frustrated roars, but it didn't cross the invisible line. Harper stumbled into the clearing behind me, face pale. What the hell is that thing? He gasped. I shook my head, barely able to catch my breath. I don't know. I looked around desperately. There had to be something, a clue about why the creature wouldn't enter the open space. And then I noticed it. The bones. Scattered all around the clearing were piles of them. Animal bones, old and weathered. Deer, elk, maybe even something bigger. It was like a graveyard, a macabre boneyard hidden deep in the heart of the forest. That's it, I said, the realization hitting me. It can't come out into the open. Something about this place. Harper looked around as if seeing the clearing for the first time. A sacred site, maybe? He sounded skeptical, but desperate. It was our only chance. I raised my rifle, taking aim at the creature. I fired, aiming not to kill, but to drive it deeper into the clearing. The bullet struck its shoulder and it recoiled with a furious roar. We kept firing, a desperate symphony of gunshots echoing around the clearing forcing the creature back with each hit. As it retreated, panic turned to something akin to cunning. It circled the boneyard, searching for an opening, but there was none. The clearing had become its prison, and with each passing moment its roars grew less angry, more a low, mournful growl. Finally, it slumped to the ground in the center of the clearing, surrounded by the bones. Whether it was giving up or dying some slow death from our bullets, I didn't know. All I knew was that the immediate danger had passed. We approached cautiously, weapons still raised. Up close, the creature was even more horrifying. Its skin pulsed with some internal rhythm, and the milky eye still tracked our movements. Harper knelt beside me, his face a mask of disgust and grudging respect. Guess we'll wait for backup here, I said, though I wasn't sure who we'd even call for this kind of thing. Wait for them to find what? Harper asked grimly gesturing at the creature. Whatever this is, they'll cover it up. Say it was a bear attack, a hoax. He was right. The world wasn't ready for the truth of what lurked in its hidden corners. A part of me wanted to forget it too, to pretend this had been a nightmare. But the other part, the part that was a ranger, sworn to protect these woods, knew we couldn't let it go. We waited as darkness fell. The creature didn't move, its growls fading into ragged breaths. When the first flashlights cut through the gloom, it wasn't backup I'd radioed. It was the elders, the old-timers from the nearby reservation. News traveled fast in these parts, especially news this strange. They came in force, faces stoic in the flickering light. 
They moved around the clearing, their chanting a low hum in the night air. They recognized this place. An elder, a woman with eyes as deep as the forest pools, came to stand before us. This place is sacred, a place of balance, she said, her voice rough with age. The creature, it was drawn here, bound here by old forces. She looked at the creature with a mix of pity and revulsion. It will stay, cannot leave now, but it should not have been disturbed. The balance is fragile. And then it happened. The creature let out one final rattling gasp. Its milky eye rolled upwards, and then it was still. The pulsing under its skin ceased. It was dead. The elders nodded solemnly. One of them produced a pouch, scattering dust from it over the creature's body. It shimmered in the flashlight beams, and then the corpse began to sink into the earth. Within minutes there was no trace of it, no blood, no bones, just the damp forest floor littered with fall leaves. It is done, the elder woman said. She glanced between Harper and me. You will remember nothing of this. Her voice held no threat, only the quiet authority of someone stating a simple, immutable fact. My mind rebelled. I wanted to argue, to demand an explanation. But even as the thought formed, it faded, replaced by a deep weariness. Harper was already lowering his rifle, a confused frown on his face. We didn't speak on the walk back. The elders vanished into the night, leaving an unsettling silence behind them. The incident report was vague. Lost hiker, no trace found, search called off. Amelia Kerr joined the ranks of the missing, her fate swallowed by the vastness of the wilderness. Only Harper and I shared the truth, a truth that was already blurring at the edges fading into the realm of half-remembered nightmares. And the nightmares did come. Horrible, vivid dreams of the creature, the charnel house clearing. I left Mount Rainier soon after. Couldn't handle the sight of the trees, the oppressive silence. Took a desk job for a while, trying to convince myself I was fine, but I never really was. I spend my days now searching for answers in old books, tribal lore, forgotten scraps of knowledge. Some corner of my mind believes if I can understand what we saw that day, it will make it less monstrous, less terrifying. But the more I uncover, the more it confirms a chilling truth. There are forces at play in the world that defy explanation. Creatures that exist in the shadows, content to remain unseen, until they aren't.